Good evening. We we'll start with a brief word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather here again this afternoon in this place, the St. Augustine's Anacom Church, to continue our series of town hall meetings. We ask for your guidance on the presenters and those who will ask questions and bring comments and uh, we are continue to ask your blessings upon this island as we continue to grapple with the effects of the ongoing pandemic. We ask these blessings in your name. Amen. Good evening once again. I would like to acknowledge the presence of our retired High Court Judge, Justice Don Mitchell. He has been faithfully attending all of our sessions so far. A special welcome as well to Miss Mary Hosford. She's a retired former, she's a retired <laughs> former senior public servant, as well as a former member of the Constitutional Committee. Our listeners via Radio Anguilla and our viewers on gov.ai in Anguilla and Lloyd's Live. I begin, as I begin all my presentations so far, with the opening stanza of our national song. God bless Anguilla, nurture and keep her. Noble and beauteous, she stands midst the sea. O land of the happy, a haven will make thee our lives and love we give unto thee. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this, the third in the series of town hall meetings that the Ministry of Home Affairs is organizing to solicit the views of the general public on constitutional reform. I would also like to state again that in the APM 2020 elections campaign manifesto policy, by way of a vision statement we stated in the earlier, that the Angola Progressive Movement APM understands that enhancing the foundation of a great society means investing more in its people and empowering them to take ownership of their own destiny. Charting our own destiny means that we have the right to self-determination as the United Nations Charter mandates. And consequently, as a people, we will have to reach a consensus on a roadmap on how this can be achieved. Tonight, we are in District 2 East End, and so it is only fitting that I read from a 2014 letter from the Father of the Nation and Constitutional Advancement to Justice Mitchell, which was published in the Anguillian newspaper. Mr. Webster was a long-term resident of Sea Feathers, a former Chief Minister of Angola. We lived until his death on December 9, 2016. I now read from that letter. It was dated the 1st of July, 2014, and is addressed to Mr. Don Mitchell, CBE QC, Owen Lane, North Hill, Anguilla. Dear Mr. Mitchell, reference independence. Let me first thank you for your letter to me of 14th May, 2014, which I have read with great interest. I agree with you that our people's distrust of governors and politicians is so great that they must be protected by including in our next constitution all of the watchdog institutions you recommend. While our older generations of politicians are discredited, I have confidence that a new generation will come who will rise above petty name calling and political intrigue. They are the ones I am depending on to take the government of this island to the next level. Anguilla definitely needs a change in every sense of the word, politically, socially, and culturally, to name a few. We need to strengthen the reins, not tighten them. In 1969, we were in a plight. We had a mandate granted by referendum to change the government of the Associated State of Sinkis, Nevis, and Anguilla to one of an independent republic. The British intervention of that year changed the plans until we are now back to full colonial status. Over the, the intervening period of time, that has served a purpose. Now we need to move from youth to adulthood. We have to continue the struggle for the benefit of the history and people of Angola 
who are still growing up. Since 1980, we have had no explanation from the British government on what we are to do from here on in. They signed an order in council between us and them as an agreement, but with only them signing it. We are now at a stalemate. I want us to move away from that situation and for us to discuss with an open mind what is needed for our protection and our progress in the future. Now that we are about to have new elections, it is important that we at least have an idea of what is actually needed for us to progress politically. We can remain a dependent territory if we want that. We cannot go back to the old constitution of 1976. We have passed that. We do not want the British to sit and feel that we are not going to develop politically. We are ready to open a new chapter. We need to go back beyond the 1982 constitution. It is antiquated. We need to pick up from where we stopped in 1969. We want to move on from where we are now and where we were before, not stand still. There must be no doubt about what we want or where we want to go. We have to progress up the hill. There must be a continuation of the struggle, not an acceptance of the status quo. Any new constitution short of independence must be just a new chapter to get us to where we want to go. I want to make sure that whatever is done, the British government understands we still remain the Queen's loyal subjects so long as she wants us. But we will one day have to decide for ourselves where we want to go from here. We need a new constitution that takes us forward. Full political independence is the ultimate aim for a future day. Yours sincerely, J. Ronald Webster, and that was copied to the governor, Ms. Christina Scott, the Honorable Hubert Hughes, Chief Minister, the Honorable McNeil Rogers, Leader of the Opposition, Honorable Edison Beard, Independent, Mr. Victor Banks, Political Leader of the Angola United Front, Ms. Pamavon Webster, Independent, Reverend Dr. Clifton Niles, Mr. Sutcliffe Hodge, and the public media. Viewers, if we, are, are as, if we as Anguillians are serious about nation building, we must really consider those thoughts of the father of the nation and act on them. I do sincerely hope that the general public have been finding these town hall meetings informative and enlightening. While attendance in person has been small, there has been extensive viewership on the online platforms, Facebook, YouTube, with over 1,000 views and climbing for both of our previous sessions. We continue to be somewhat hampered by the health restrictions occasioned by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic in terms of persons being able to physically attend these sessions. But I'm very pleased that my ministry is once again teaming up with the Department of Information Technology Dites and Mr. Gilbert Fleming and staff of Titanium Sounds and in Anguilla to provide excellent audio, visual, and streaming services for this meeting and the other meetings to come. I also want to acknowledge from last week the invaluable assistance by Ms. Cornel Chong down at West End. She is the manager of the youth center there, and she did an excellent job in setting up the hall for us, making sure that we were all properly social distance, cleaning the room and so forth. So Cornel, we just want to extend our thanks to you from last week. I also want to acknowledge the invaluable assistance being provided by my able and capable permanent secretary, Dr. Aidan Harrigan and other technical staff at the Ministry of Home Affairs in ensuring that the town hall meetings take place smoothly. With all the above having been said, I now invite from the Secretary of Home Affairs, Dr. Harrigan, to present on Anguilla's constitutional evolution and the key changes under consideration for this round of constitutional reform. Following that, the floor will be open and our online platform will be open to accept your questions and comments. Thank you, Dr. Harrigan. Thank you, Minister Hodge, and good evening to those here in church and also listening online. Right, so first slide, 
um, international legal mandate. And according to the United Nations Charter, all peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely determine their economic, social, and cultural development. So a key phrase there is self-determination, and you would have heard in that letter from 2014 from the Father of the Nation, a reference to self-determination as well. Okay, classification. So how is Angola classified currently? Angola is classified as what is called a non-self-governing territory. By way of the United Nations Resolution 66 1 of 1946, a list of non self governing territories um, was created. Uh, by way of UN Resolution 1960, uh, Resolution 1541 15, identified that self determination is attained through three modes through independence, free association, and integration. The United Nations in 1961 established the Special Committee on Decolonization, the so-called so Committee of 24. Um, the UK government, as an administering power, is obligated to report on an annual basis on the progress of its non-self-governing territories attaining self-determination. The United Nations declared the first international decade on decolonization to run from 1991 to 2000 with the intention that all non-self-governing territories would qualify for removal from that list by the end of that period. However, there have been three additional international decades on decolonization 2001 to 2011, no, sorry, 2001 to 2010, 2011 to 20, 2020, and now 2021 to 2030. Um, as I said, there are still 17 non-governing, non-self-governing territories, of which Angola is one. So, to provide some definitions in terms of the modes of self-determination. Independence, a uh, country gains independence if it has its own government and is not ruled by any other state or country. And so we have um, Jamaica, example Jamaica, um, which gained independence from Britain in 1962. Free association, free association shall be a result of a free and voluntary choice by the peoples of the territory concerned, expressed through informed and democratic processes, and should permit the right to determine the internal constitution without in, outside interference. An example of that in our region is Puerto Rico and its status with the United States of America. Integration. This should be on the basis of complete equality between the people of the former territory and the country to which it has been integrated. And an example in our region is that of Martinique and Guadeloupe and their status with France. Okay, now to whip through Angola's evolving status. Angola was established as a British colony in 1650 and was administered through Antigua. In 1825, administrative control was switched to Sinkits. In 1967, um, evolving from the whole push uh, to end the UK um, colonies in the West Indies, um, the UK established the Associated States of Sinkits, Nevis, Angola and the status represented semi-independence for the tri-state in that the UK government was responsible for 
um, foreign affairs and external defense and everything else um, in terms of the, the, ter the tri-state had full internal self-government. However, suffering years of neglect, Angolians were not happy with that lot, and as we know that fateful the, uh, number of events, the statehood show, Queen Show was, was interrupted as, as we know from history, and um, the expulsion of the Ketishan police, and so that day that we all know of, um, some of us from history books, some of us, some who lived through it, Angola, what is known as Angola Day, um, May 30th, 1967. Also in 1967, there was a referendum, July 11, 1967, and the result of the referendum was that Angola should secede from the tri-state. A constitution which was drafted by Harvard law professor Roger Fisher was adopted. In 1969, February 6, there was another, following another referendum, Angola was de declared as an independent republic, so-called unilateral declaration of independence. And the constitution adopted was won by a Jack Hocum. And I just say, happy to see some additional folks trickling in, including um, Paul Sek, um, which is Quincy Gums Murray. On March 19, March 19, 1969, um, the UK British troops invaded Angola. And then by way of a formal legal edict, there was the Angola Act of 1971, and um, the vestiges of this has obtained since. In 1976, there was a new constitution approved, and that provided for ministerial government. And um, so, you know, now we have, for example, a Minister of Finance, and we have a Minister of Home Affairs, and so on. So that constitution provides, provided for that. The next um, moment of, of import was the Angola Act of 1980. And to that act, it empowered Her Majesty to separate Angola from the Associated State um, on a date appointed, which was adopted as December 19, 1980. And as we had previously indicated, this required cooperation of the government in Sinkits, um, of Sinkits Nevis, and that was the People Action Movement, PAM, led by, led by um, Dr. Kennedy Simmons. And they also paved the way for uh, Sinkits Nevis going independent in 1980. The Constitution currently in effect is the Constitutional Order of 1982 as amended in 1980. And one of the provisions of the 1990 um, Constitution Amendment was to provide for the position called Leader of the Opposition. There was a further amendment in 2019, which we will, the provisions which we will get to a bit later. Okay, recent attempts at constitutional reform. So in the 1999, under the Labour government, the UK um, published a policy which would define its relations with its um, territories, remaining territories, and the expectations on both sides. And that was called the uh, Partnership for Progress and Prosperity. Um, as for the policy, 
the overseas territories were restyled and renamed. Um, sorry, the, the territories were known as, became known as overseas territories rather than dependent territories. Another feature of the policy was that it called for um, constitutional commissions or, or, or committees to be established and that the territory should make um, proposals, submit proposals to the UK for constitutional change. The UK government, however, was clear to state that for those territories um, who wish to become independent, they could do so following, as long as, as it was the clearly expressed wish of the majority of the citizens, for example, um, by means of a referendum. And, and um, otherwise they could stay, but it ruled out integration with the UK or, or free association. Okay, so over the years there have been a number of constitutional reform committees. In 2000 there was one which met um, quite a bit, had a lot of meetings and so on. Um, no recommendations were made formally, although subsequently various speeches and transcripts of meetings were, were made available publicly. One event of note, in 2003 for the first time, the United Nations held a decolonization seminar um, in a non self governing territory, um, and they held it in Angola. And as part of its message to that seminar, the United Nations Secretary General reiterated that achieving self government for the peoples of the world has been one of the cardinal goals of the United Nations since its inception. In 2006, another constitutional committee was established. It also held, it held extensive consultations and included, concluded its work within 16 months, but no, there was no um, adoption of its recommendations by, by executive council or the government of the day. In 2015, another committee, constitutional committee was, was established and again met um, extensively and had a number of consultations. And in this time, and it, and re, it tabled a report and a draft constitution was tabled in January 2017. By way of, of note, um, the Angular constitution can be said that in origin as being a constitutional dictatorship. For example, under the 1980 Angola Act, the UK government at any point by order of council could impose direct rule um, unilaterally. So, um, based on the public consultations, two predominant views um, was made by the public. Um, number one, there was an expressed desire to improve democracy uh, in the legal and constitutional constructs of Angola, and two, to improve standards in public life. Okay, so now going forward to, to um, Actual, the actual constitution and the content, as we would have indicated previously, in 2019, um, in November 2019, the UK team came to Angola and held negotiations with the government, well, with the Angola team that was cross-party and, and also covered, um, comprised a number of institutions, so there were there were members from the AUF administration of the day. Um, there was also representation from the, the APM. There was representation by the leader of opposition at that time, Ms. Pam Van Webster, and from bodies such as the Angular Bar Association. 
And following that, following that, those discussions, the UK government would have made changes as were agreed and then also highlighted language or areas that were still needed to be determined and finalized. Um, and that, that draft constitution is posted on the Government of Angola website, so you can log on and, and print it off or just peruse it, whatever you desire. So um, looking at it, if we start with the preamble, and the preamble usually provides sort of um, guiding philosophy um, um, uh, uh, in terms of, of the uh, important, what is felt as important to highlight in terms of overarching aspects. And just picked out three areas um, to, to highlight. Um, one preamble goes, whereas the people of the territory of Angola have over centuries evolved with distinct cultural identity and will, which is the essence of an Angolian, and acknowledging that the society of Angola is based on certain moral, spiritual, and democratic values, including the belief in God and the inherent dignity of the human person, the inalienable right, the il right of the freedom, sorry, there's a mistake here, of the individual and respect for fundamental rights and freedoms and the rule of law. And affirming that the peoples of Angola generally have expressed a desire to become a self-governing people and to exercise the highest degree of control over the affairs of the country at this stage of its development. Moving on, um, one of the ways in which the drafters of the proposed constitution would have sought to um, address what could be called a democratic deficit was to provide for an increased number of elected representatives. So therefore, in the House of Assembly, the proposal is to, is to increase the number of elected members to not less than 13 while eliminating non-elected members. If you recall, um, and this, there was a change in May 2019, the special provision, and it eliminated um, two of the non-elected members and the persons of what were called nominated members. There was also a proposal that Angola should be a single electoral district and shall return no less than four members to the assembly and provision for no less than nine individual district members. And again, one of the outcomes of the amendment which was made in May 2019 was that it allowed for um, island-wide, the island-wide um, election of four representatives um, by, yes, to the House of Assembly. And so um, four members were elected by that means in the 2020 June general elections, including Minister of Home Affairs here, Minister Kenneth Hodge. The proposal is that in terms of any changes to individual districts, that this should be made um, according to law and should, the whole process should first be informed by a district boundaries commission. And as Minister Hodge would have indicated previously and in press conferences, there are a variety of ways where um, consideration is being given to, in terms of the district representation. One option is to keep the seven, the existing um, seven, a uh, number of districts to seven, but have a more equal um, distribution of the population across those districts. As we know, and as was indicated last Thursday, we have District 7, which is one of the smallest districts, and the district we are in, in to, this evening, District number 2, Sandy Hill, is also um, 
one of the, the smallest districts. There's also the suggestion that the number of districts should be increased to nine rather than, than seven. Um, just going back a bit, in terms of the, the island-wide um, representation, there is um, different views. There are views that you should maintain the current system, but perhaps, I mean, in terms of, of four, uh, uh, something similar, but have um, the executive elected. So each party would have to nominate to say, well, this person is up for premier, this person would be up for um, minister of home affairs, this person would be up for uh, minister of infrastructure and so on. Then there's, a, the, uh, there's another view that um, that district representation should be completely done away with and all representatives to the House of Assembly should be elected on an island-wide basis. So again, I think going through the record of the recording of the meeting last week, we saw where some folks weighed in, and so we would again invite your views, and um, they, they are being recorded and will be taken into consideration. There's, again, looking at what is called the democratic deficit, there's this whole question of whether um, persons sitting in the House who would not have been elected, whether they should, in fact, have the power to vote. And as we know, um, that particular subject um, has, been this, has been a topic of a lot of discussion since July 2020, this 2021, this year, when the, the AG and the Deputy Governor would have voted to, for the passage of the GSD bill. In fact, they were the deciding votes. Um, the proposal in the draft constitution is that the AG and DG would not have any vote. It would not have voting powers. So why is it, why is it important to increase the number of elected representatives? Um, one of the reasons is to um, protect from what is called uh, the House of Assembly being a mere rubber stamp, namely that in the Executive Council, that is where policy and, and legislation is voted on, and then the legislation or regulations or whatever comes to the House of Assembly for passage and to be given the effect of law. And so, um, if the numbers are not balanced in a certain way, not, they're not um, sufficient numbers, it means that by perforce, if the government side sticks together, everything that is passed in the executive council um, passes. So then the House members would be just, could be shouting um, from, from sunup to sundown, but once the government side stays united, then, then it, 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 it would have its way in, in ex quo. Moving on, as, as indicated, another view that was expressed from the consultations is that there needed to be an improvement in the standards in public life. And one area that has been highlighted in, in the proposed constitution is to have um, um, regulation of campaign um, finance. And simply put, you want to ensure that for those, en those entities and persons putting themselves up um, for office, that the means available to them would be on an equal playing field as much as possible. And also that um, the whole system of government is not subverted to the will of big business interests, for example. So this would put Angola on a footing with a lot of um, Commonwealth countries and especially the more the developed ones such as, as well, again, the UK and, and Canada and Australia and so on. One recommendation also made and is the provision in the draft constitution is for what is called institutions and individuals to protect good governance. And in the letter that Minister Hodge read earlier from um, um, the late 
father of the nation to Justice Mitchell, he would have commended um, the committee um, for making such provision as he saw uh, them as being essential for good governance. Um, so examples are some of these are existing, some of them um, there's a proposal to, to enact um, public service commission, pub police service commission, um, electoral boundaries commission, Angular Status Commission, a Public Procurement Services Commission, Appointments Commission, and um, in this particular one, as I said, in recent times you've seen there's been a lot of debate about the quality of persons um, on, on boards, the various statutory bodies and so on, and the view is, okay, yes, in conjunction with the provisions in the particular act, say for example the, the ASPA act or whatever, but um, that there will be appointments. And so this commission as provided for by the constitution will run the rule over candidates that are put forward and, and then made the recommendation. Judicial and legal services, um, integrity commission, um, very important, and commissions of inquiry, again very important as checks and balances um, to, to protect against the abuse of power. And commissions of inquiry, nobody is immune from the prime, prime minister or premier as the case may be right down the, the line. There's also the recommendation to have a human rights commissioner Complaints Commissioner and a Freedom of Information Commissioner. And Freedom of Information, again, is seen as one of those constructs to really have proper accountability um, and transparency, which are essential elements of good governance. Continuing with improving the standards in public life, so there is now recommendation to have an extensive um, section in the Constitution to deal with public finance. In the Constitution, as it currently obtains, there's a very short section on Constitution which deals on public finance, which deals with things like appointment of the chief auditor, and so on. So, what is proposed in the in that chapter, that section? Um, seems to be modeled of the, the Turks and Caicos Island 2011 Constitution, which is the most recent constitution of the overseas territories. Um, some items to note. Uh, there is a recommendation, or uh, there's a section provided for uh, proposed that the current Fiscal Responsibility Act um, be repealed and replaced with a new fiscal framework. And so that means that um, there would have to be negotiations between the UK government and the government of Angola to, to agree on a new framework. One of the most, the framework deals with things like what they call, um, in terms of principles, value for money, um, um, transparency and, and so on, um, um, public financial, sound public financial management and so on. And one of the areas that is provided for in the Fiscal Responsibility Act and uh, a company framework is what is called borrowing guidelines. So it, it, it limits the amount that, that the Angola can borrow gross debt um, it, uh, it limits the, the amount of debt service that it can be incurred, and it also provides for what is called a rainy day fund, and that the Angola should keep in hand 90 days worth of recurrent expenditure. Interestingly, the UK have recommended or suggested that uh, one of the sections to be included in this would be a section, explicit section on the functions of the governor 
Um, this does not appear in the TCI constitution, so again, there should be determination of whether that should be um, included in, in Angola's constitution. Moving on, um, the power of the governor. So uh, earlier I would have went through a number of changes to Angola's constitution going back from the various acts and so on from 1971. Um, but one of the, and while there have been some changes, one of, one of the constant features, and in fact, um, maybe even a, a growth in the power is, is that as the powers um, bestowed under UK appointed representative, the governor. Uh, the 1982 constitution would have reduced the level of internal self-government, um, which were included under associated statehood. And in fact, the only overseas territory which has an advanced state of internal self-government is, is um, Bermuda, but Bermuda was seen to be a, a halfway, a stepping stone to independence, but it never went. And the UK government and various edicts and policies, in fact, there's another, I, I should probably reference it in the future, um, presentation so that people can um, can can go in and research it look it up from there has there was actually another I think it was in 2017 or thereabouts there was another 2016 another policy paper on the overseas territories that were that was published by the UK government and it basically reinforces what was said in a number of letters to the territories from various foreign secretaries of state um, to say that as long as the territories chose to remain aligned with the UK, the UK had to retain certain executive and legislative powers to be, that could be enforced through the governor and the secretary of state. And this was to ensure that there was compliance with the UK's international obligations and any obligations that the international obligations that the territory signed up to, the maintenance of good governance, and to manage UK contingent liabilities. So, um, if it was a nightmare, what worst case scenario, and that, say, for example, Angola were to become bankrupt or the verge of becoming bankrupt. The UK government is obliged to step in and provide assistance. Um, that would have actually happened to the TCI, I think, in 2008. Um, and the UK government provided loan funds um, and backed loan guarantees, provided loan guarantees to enable the TCI government to raise money to meet its obligations. Now, such assistance comes from the UK taxpayers, and so the UK government maintains that it is essential um, for them to, 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 to um, act preemptively. And so you see over the years in, in Angola and other territories a number of changes to the frameworks. We mentioned the fiscal framework. Recently, in the House of Assembly, the Public Procurement Act was amended um, to mandate that not only government departments which were seeking to procure goods and services, but also the statutory bodies such as Angola ELC Port Authority, the Health Authority, the Water Authority, that they had to come under the provisions of the Procurement Act because guess what? For those, in particular those entities that receive a full subvention, if they were to run into um, difficulty, the government of Angola have to pick up the tab, provide assistance, and then if you take, as I said earlier, if the government of Angola ran into difficulty, then the UK government would come into play. So, moving on, the executive. Um, the 
maintaining the executive authority of the government in Gola shall be vested in Her Majesty. Um, the proposed constitution, um, there's a recommendation that the executive body be re 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 renamed from executive council to cabinet, and further that cabinet shall consist of the premier, which, which is the lead, who is the leader of government business, and that was renamed from chief minister in May 2019. And then you should have not more than five other ministers and then two ex officio members in the form of the AG and uh, the Attorney General and the Deputy Governor, and, and then also um, who should, the recommendation is that they should not vote, and then that cabinet should be chaired by a Majesty's appointed representative, the Governor. Most, in fact, constitutions around the world, different countries have this kind of provision was called Protection of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms. And the UK government was quite clear in their discussions in, um, in November 2019 that as long as Angola wishes to remain an overseas territory, then the UK government would insist on certain provisions and language in the constitution which would allow the UK government to um, discharge of its obligations as being a signatory to various international conventions and, and, and as may have been extended to Angola. And an example of this is um, has to do with the protection of right to marry. Um, in terms of what was proposed by the GOA side in November 2019, um, it proposed language for marriage as between persons of the opposite sex, while the UK is insisting on no such limitation as to do so, um, in their view, would put Angola at odds with, for example, the U European Convention of Human Rights, um, which does not allow for discrimination on the base, basis of sexual orientation. Independence, so in the letter you'd have heard the um, Minister Aj read from the Father of the Nation from 2014, in fact was titled Independence. And the question, the question that was tabled in the November 2019 discussions was whether the Constitution should have a clause that provides a framework for triggering the process of independence. And the UK responded that in their view, that is not necessary because all the various constitutional amendments and you know, uh, whatever is in place, constitution is there. For Angola, they make reference to the Angola Act of 1980. And the Angola Act of 1980 um, recognizes that eventually Angola Angolans may want independence, and um, there is provision in in that act to to trigger um, independence. So the question is that sufficient, or or um, should there be anything additional? I would have moving on. I would have mentioned earlier that the notwithstanding the fact that the constitutional committee reform committee of twenty. 15 to 2017, that they will have tabled what is called um, an overall um, document with many sections. Um, that, notwithstanding, the government of the day, the United Front government, um, requested to the UK government to have three um, changes to the Angular Constitution by way of an Ardern Council. And this was done, this was granted in. May of 2019, I mentioned earlier, so we now have um, Premier instead of Chief Minister. There's a provision to elect members, four members of the House of Assembly on the basis of island-wide um, elections. And then sec there, there's a section now that allows um, for great-grandchildren 
um, of a person who is, who is born in Anguilla, um, but the grandchild not born in Anguilla, um, to be given Anguilla status. So that um, overview of the Constitution, the Constitution is, is draft Constitution is 70 pages, I think, so um, can't quite deal with everything in it, but um, if there's any element that you would want um, address, uh, you know, questions asked, you're free to do so and we'll do our best. But in concluding, um, we pose three questions. One, do the proposed changes satisfy the demand by the public to have um, increased democracy? In other words, do the changes proposed, would they result in what is called, something called the reduction in the democratic deficit? Two, do the proposed changes satisfy the demand for improved standards in public life? And three, are there any other principles of note or provisions which you, the public, would want reflected in the revised um, constitution to come. Um, um, so with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. And, um, and just this slide there shows the address, our email addresses that you could, um, that you can contact us by, or you can leave your comments in the, in the online or you can call, or you can write, however you want to make your views known, um, please do, and we welcome it. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Harrigan. Before I open the floor, I just want to make a few general comments. Um, the question was asked of us, why didn't we just take one central place and have these discussions? It was a deliberate decision to move to each of the seven districts because we wanted each district to feel a part of this process. Even though we could not congregate in the numbers we expect because of the current health protocols, we feel the fact that we are going to each of the districts gives each um, constituency a feeling of inclusion in this process. And two, people are saying that it's an it's a exercise in futility. I don't agree with that. I think as a people, we have to make every possible opportunity we can to have a say in our destiny. And this process allows us to have a meaningful say in what our final constitution may look like. It may not necessarily be everything we want, but I think this represents an opportunity for us to have a part in that process. And then another question was asked of me. We already have a draft constitution. But this draft constitution, I wish to point out, was prepared and revised by the United Kingdom following discussions in Anguilla in 2019. This draft constitution is simply, as it says, a draft. And, it rep and if you go through it, you will see there are a lot of footnotes that represent areas of um, areas for clarification, areas where there, there was no clear consensus. So we will be drafting a new constitution based on what we are doing now, based on what the Constitutional Committee will come up with, for moving on. This draft, as it is here, is available on the government website. It's available by email at any of those email addresses there. And if it's also available on WhatsApp. I've been sending it to quite a few people via WhatsApp. So we are utilizing social media to really get this around. And we're inviting each and every person to be a part of this process. What I'm finding out, and I'll be very blunt, persons do not participate, but yet they go after and they complain. We were not involved in the process. We did not get an opportunity to participate. And I'm saying here tonight, this is the third time that we are here. 
tonight in District 2, and we are going to all the other um, four districts over the next couple of weeks to give persons an opportunity to be part of the process. Um, I'm going to open the floor for questions, and perhaps I could start off going back to the letter that the Father of the Nation would have written to Mr. Mitchell, and we are happy to have him here again. He's braved the late evening to be here with us, and we are very grateful for that. So maybe we could hear from him his thoughts on how that letter would have impacted the process of constitutional reform at that time. And I see Mary there is also a keen historian in terms of constitutional advance. Could we hear their thoughts on that? Thank you, Minister Hodge. Well, the letter that you read did have a little history to it. Uh, a few months before that letter, uh, Mr. Webster invited me to his house to talk to me about what did we need to do to achieve independence sooner rather than later. And we discussed what was involved in independence, what the risks were, what the advantages were. And he said to me, well, there are a lot of ideas floating around. Could you put them in writing for me so that I can study them and, and understand them better than I could by just listening to you talking? So I wrote him a long letter setting out what I thought were some of the essentials that we had to do before we would be ready for independence. And his response was that letter. The letter that you read was his response to my letter, which set out what I thought were the, were the requirements. And, and it was nothing special in my letter. My letter basically set out what the 2006 or 7 report recommended. My, my, uh, my recollection is that my letter to him was nothing more than an explanation of all of the good governance institutions before we go independent, before the people of Anguilla are willing to trust their treasure and their lives to our ministers in full independence, the people of Anguilla have indicated in the, in, the conf in the meetings and the correspondence that we held in the 2007, 2005, 6, 7, uh, to, um, what, what was it called? Constitutional and Electoral Reform Commission, that exercise of public consultation. The public wanted to be sure that Anguillian ministers of government the Angola public service, the people who would run us, rule us, would be constrained by a constitution, by enforceable provisions that would allow us to hold them to high standards. We didn't want to go like some of our brothers and sisters in Caribbean and other countries in the Commonwealth that have gone independent, where once they go independent, they are thoroughly abused by the officials who are in charge, whether elected or unelected. So that is why, uh, th that is what we called in the, in the slide that Dr. Harrigan showed us, that people wanted to see more democracy. They wanted to see that the people will rule. The, the ministers of government must be the servants of the people. So people want to see an increase in democracy, and they want to see more guarantees of good government. Those are the two exercises that the 2007 report and the, and the Constitution, which was drafted immediately after that report. It wasn't in the report, but uh, Chief Minister Osborne Fleming, I think it was, asked for a draft to be prepared that would inform and educate all Anguillians in what those recommendations would look like if put into written form. Lolita Davis Richardson did a draft. I did a draft. Um, a couple of other people did draft, so there were two or three draft constitutions in circulation which attempted to show what the 2007 recommendations would look like. Well, unfortunately, the very same year or early the next year, there was a general election, and the party that had commissioned all of this work lost office, and a new party came into power. You remember 2005, right? 2005, 2006, they were right at the cusp there. So, as usual, all the work that was done by the previous administration was sort of dropped, and we had to wait and see what would happen. There were a number of crises which stopped constitutional reform from being on the front burner, 
It was revived after yet another general election in 2015, stimulated particularly by the same year the British sending to the Angola government a draft order in council saying that Angola was so badly running itself that they were about to take us over, like Turks and Caicos had been taken over. They sent us what they call the 2015 draft financial order in council, which um, so shocked everybody that the constitutional reform process was restarted. One of the recommendations that came out of the discussions with government ministers and um, parliamentarians and members of the public was that we should put into our constitution the better parts of the draft order in council so it became our provisions instead of British provisions and we should leave out the parts that we found, the people of Angola found offensive and that is what was done. That is now chapter 10 of the constitution. So Mr. Webster's letter acknowledges uh, these principles. He says in his letter, I agree with you that we have to take steps to ensure that we achieve this level of government before we can go into independence. What he was doing was acknowledging all of these things. But his aim is to achieve, he's saying in his letter, but we must never forget that the ultimate aim is full independence. But nobody can disagree with that. We all want to be in charge of our own affairs. The only question is, are we sure that we are ready to put our confidence in our leaders at this stage of administration? Remembering also how young government is in Angola. You know, Angola is the newest Commonwealth country, I believe. Uh, Montserrat and Barbados had a parliament making laws since the 1630s and 40s. When was the first law enacted by a parliament of Angola? 1976. We never had a law made by Anguillians before 1976. Under the Anguilla regulations of um, 1971, when the British uh, uh, had the first so-called constitution for Angola, uh, it, was the, it was the commissioner who made laws. There was a council which advised him, but there wasn't a proper house of assembly that, that passed laws as we are accustomed to in a, in a modern constitutional system until the 1976 constitution. Look at how new we are. We are a baby. Angola, in terms of government, is a baby compared to Barbados and Montserrat. Angola has no tradition of government. Angola has little or no experience, few or no conventions about how we are supposed to conduct ourselves. Up until recently, and maybe it still prevails, any Angolian could bang on the premier's door and go in without an appointment and take up half his morning talking to him about their personal problems. I have seen that happen with Emil Gums in Emil Gums's office. I'm in there in a meeting and people bang on the door and come in and demand to be heard immediately. I've seen that with Osborne Fleming. I, I've seen that with Hubert Hughes. I've seen that with Victor Banks. We have, of course, now uh, a new administration, and I haven't had the privilege of being in a meeting with any ministers where members of the public have banged on the door. Permanent secretaries may be a little more diligent in protecting their ministers from being assaulted by the, by the public in that way. But we were so new in government up until very recently that we have no traditions of good government. We need to put institutions in place that will force us all to practice good government. And if I might just take advantage of one thing I wanted, a little bone I wanted to pick with Dr. Harrigan. He has said in the past three meetings now, in his mention of chapter five of the new constitution, that no attempt has been made to reduce the powers of the governor. Well, I just want, to, I just want us to look at that and to consider whether that is accurate. One of the things, to be clear, every single power of the governor has been removed or reduced. The truth is that that statement is not correct. In the, previous, in the existing constitution, the one that we are trying to replace, the governor has in several sections power to act unilaterally. Take, for instance, the appointment of civil servants, public servants. Under the present constitution, the governor could appoint who he wants to any position in the public service. There is a public service commission, but the section in the constitution says the governor may consult the Public Service Commission. We're even bound to follow the advice of the Public Service Commission. The governor has total power 
over whom to appoint, who to, who to give a salary increase to, and who to terminate. That's what the Constitution says. It doesn't mean the governor actually behaves like that. The governor, in fact, as we all know, usually takes the advice of the Public Service Commission. But he or she isn't bound to. The people of Angola consider that to be quite inappropriate. Clearly, Angolians have a better knowledge and a better feel for who is competent and who is capable than a person who is coming from England to act as governor. It is more appropriate that Angolians should decide through the Public Service Commission who should be appointed and who should not. So the draft constitution takes away the power of the governor to decide on who should be appointed to be a civil servant and gives it, vests that power in the Public Service Commission. And that is so for every single section in the existing or old constitution, which I'm calling it now, uh, that deals with the powers of the governor. We have done the same thing with ministers of government. It may not have been in the constitution, but as we all know, ministers did a lot of things very arbitrarily without any reference to any principle or any rule or any, any idea of good government. We all know that under the present system, um, a planning board decision, the planning committee might decide that a certain license shouldn't be granted because there's not enough provision for frontage, for space between the public road and the building. So they tell the developer, the homeowner who's trying to build their home, look, you've got to relocate your building. We, we can't allow this because you don't have enough room. The building board may make a decision. They're not going to give building board approval because of certain technical reasons. We know that the present system is that we can run to executive council and ask executive council to overturn the decision of the technicians. And people do do that. And frequently you, you hear about people having the, the, um, the decision of the planning committee or the or the building board, overturned on the basis of what principle? It might be a good principle that they were acting on, but you don't really know because it's not explained anywhere. It might be favoritism or family or, or some other reason, but we just don't know. Those will no longer, those kinds of powers of politicians will no longer exist under the draft constitution. The British have accepted the drafting committee's recommendation, um, draft constitution, which is based mainly on the recommendations from 2007, as educated and informed by the subsequent meetings and consultations that the committee had. But the main principles remain the same. The, the only thing new is the chapter 10, the, the order, the finance provisions, because that only was invented in 2015, long after the 2007 report had been written. So democracy involves removing arbitrary and, and uh, government by governor or ministers that we don't understand what principles they're acting on. We, we are left confused. We are left to feel that they may have done something unfair. We are, the draft constitution, as accepted by the British, re reverses that situation and gives the decisions back to Anguillian institutions. That is what we are calling an increase in democracy and an increase in good government. Those are the main points that I think I would like to make. Thank you very much, Mr. Mitchell. The point is taken. Um, I think, though, that if you were to Think about um, in the overall context, and I think that's a fundamental tension with, and I think Tommy Estefan, he wrote an article in the, the paper last week which gives all the authorities of the governor and so on. And, and the UK government has been clear about this, that um, Yes, as long as the territories remain, want to remain um, with, aligned to the UK, they cannot um, even go back to the situation where we had, um, like say, the associated um, statehood, where there was full um, internal self-government. So 
Um, and as I mentioned, Bermuda has a more um, superior con constitution. So a lot of um, a lot of what still obtains um, can be removed by the stroke of a pen in terms of a reverse by the um, the UK um, governor or the secretary of state and so on. So um, while we talk about democracy, <laughs> it's still it's still um, they're still constrained in terms of what is possible. Um, yeah. So it just at least it seems to me. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Aswad, you had wanted to make a comment, please? Yes. Thank you very much, Ken, Mr. Honorable. Um, one of my first questions, I think you answered it because I wanted to know which draft constitution we should be studying. And the one that's on, on line now, which was done by the, revised by the UK, following this discussions in, from 19, draft constitution of Angola revised by the UK following discussions in Angola right in 2019. Because reading through it, I haven't read the entire document, but I've read quite a bit of it. I see they were alluding to things that have to be done and under consideration by Anguilla. So that led me to believe that there's somewhere out there, there's another draft. I don't know if this exercise is to give you more information to input into that draft. But then to me, then people would have to know what it is that is in here, as you may want to come up with. Because looking at this, a lot of it goes right back to the 2017 draft that was done. And as we said, some of it was taken out and cherry picked and put into the 1982 constitution. I think I heard the PS referring to five uh, ministers but this doesn't have that because it was done before the elections and that five ministers would not have come into effect until after the elections. So there are things like that. And I, I want to, 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 to um, refer to the one about this United Nations and, 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 and Britain and their different things with that, and especially when it comes to the same-sex marriage. Her Majesty the Queen said she was not passing it on to the overseas territories. They had to do it themselves. Anyone who wants to read it, go online. All the information is there. There's so much information there. And another thing, churches had the opportunity to see whether or not they wanted to be a part of that um, direction, or whatever you call it. I happen to know that the Church of England, of which this church, I believe, is a part of, they can't force us because they can't change the Church of England. There's some, some, something with agreement they had years ago, so they can't um, do that. But would any of us here like to see coming up the aisle one person is there waiting, waiting for the other one to come up. And then before our minister, two people of the same sex to be married. Now, I have always heard them say that Angola is a Christian island. And I think this is going to be a test for us to prove if it is, because the British cannot force us into it. Up to just today, I was reading something, and they were saying there were so many countries, and only, not all of them, have agreed to same-sex marriages, because they can't force it upon people. Even in the United States, I believe, not all the states have agreed to it. So, to say that to you is just to force you. They cannot do it. They cannot do it. But you see, they will get through if we pass 
the law using the language they have in here because they have given you three ones, the ones that was proposed by us and two other samples. And once there's a law, then anybody can get up and they, they can pass it. We're talking about the government and the people not I'm really sure that they have the, 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 the oh, I don't want to use the word guts, <laughs> to do certain things, right? But there's this total distrust. Now, we talk about independence. Mr. Webster spoke about it, but listening to what was in that letter, I think he's saying, prepare yourself for independence. You cannot get up tomorrow and say, oh, we're going independent and be independent by next week. You cannot. You have to put things in place. Who are you going to run to. Right now, look what's happening to Angola. Who are we running to for help? How many of our people are benefiting from this connection? People who are saying, oh, they do that. I don't know if they understand the extent to which we are being helped. And Angolians don't want to pay their taxes. Let's face it. Let's be upfront with it, you know, and things like that. So, all who are saying that, Mr. Webster is saying, prepare yourself. We are using the word democracy these days. And every time I hear it, it takes me back to 19-something. First reading about democracy and things. And it was different then. And you could see the changes. People think because the governor is in position, that person is responsible for democracy. It's the people. It's the people, right? If we don't stand up for what we want, how will we get it? Everything will be forced upon us. So whenever you're doing the Constitution, please don't be afraid of the British. Do what we know is right for our people, what our people are saying they want. The next thing... Um, the constituencies. I think you said, um, you know, there's the, the, the several things you would like to uh, be considered on the table. And one that struck me was to split District 4 and 3 into two. But District 6 is also a very big constituency. And number 7 next to it is a small one. I think what we were saying, when you do it, you put it, the boundaries and must, commission must do it, but in such a way that it will be more, what's the right word for that, Don? That you, you, it, proper representation, everybody, I won't feel well that I'm not being represented enough in the House of Assembly or an Executive Council because I'm a small. Thing. Everybody, there will be equal representation and aspect for that. And the next thing is, is this. I like at large. I like the at large. Everybody run at large. You know, I've heard on the radio people are saying, and it, it upsets me because a government is in power. Whoever they are, they are in power. You know, and I don't like the remarks that are made sometimes, but that's just me. But it said, imagine someone who, run, who ran at large has more votes than the person who ran in the district. And it is true. And it is true. It brings up the question to me, who should be? Who should be? <laughs> Who should be in charge? But it is what it is now. So, but I think the premier himself said he doesn't mind. He, he, he lies at large and let all, everybody run at large. And the people are asking for that. As a matter of fact, further than that, they were saying, if you want to be premier, run for premier. You see, people out there thinking, 
run for premier. And, and, and so we find we'll have better representation. And you wouldn't have to go through all the trouble of changing boundaries here, changing boundaries there, changing the other things. I had already said to myself that I know the way they're going to do it, that district, I might end up in district two. <laughs> but I've been in district one, and I would like to stay in district one. But it's a fact, because I'm right on the boundary. So if they move the, 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 the boundary, I'll end up in another district. And that sort of thing that was going to create another problem with the voters. They're already registered to vote in a specific district. So it's going to entail quite a bit of work to get it sorted out. Run let everybody run at large. Let them run at large. We can't assume that in the House, that when elections are held, that one party may not get all the, the, the seats. Now we're going to see where true representation, where true, maybe some form of democracy is, because who will be on the back bench and who will be in the front? And that brings up another thing, that should you run for separate executive from the legislature? Should you separate the two? I don't know how it would work. I don't know if Don would be able to see how that sort of thing would work. But it is something that is to be, because we're trying to, 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 to modernize our constitution. There are a lot of things out there to do. And so just don't sit down. And Dr. Harvan. I, I, I have to say something. In the 2017 draft, reference has been made to a number of constitutions that were done within Anguilla. And it's in the footnotes. And so Mr. Mitchell was just referring to the one that he did in 2006. And so a draft was presented in 2008, and then there was one Lolita Richardson draft, and there was also one done by Reverend John E. Gums, and there was also one done by Reverend Clifton Niles, Dr. Clifton Niles, and that 2017 constitution pulled things from all of them, because as you well know, Minister Hodge, you put in our job box how many documents and all these documents, so they're there for someone to see. So they were submitted to somebody somewhere in the ministry. If they didn't carry it forward well, whose fault is that? I, I don't know. And which one reached to the British government? Because I can remember being at a meeting at the Eastern Basketball Court when the Osmond Fleming was talking about the Constitution, one of them that he was going to take to England. As a matter of fact, I got the impression that it had already been sent to England and things like that. So people have been working on them all the time. It's just every time you have an election, everything seemed to drop through the fall off the, the cliff, which let's hope that someday that sort of thing will stop. And if you want that stop, you have to say what you want for Angola, not for next elections, but for years to come. And people must follow them, learn to follow them, continue them. Don't because I just come and I can change for changing sake. You don't. See what's there first. If it's good, keep it. If it's not good for the, you change that. But don't just throw everything out. So, I'll say that for now. So, Ms. Aswell, really thank you for those in-depth comments and I just wanted to say a few things based on what you would have said. <clears throat> um, 
In terms of the boundaries, of course, we have to consider setting up the Boundaries Commission to deal with that. But there were five options that have been put on the table, and I would like let to share them quickly. I know the PS alluded to them. One was where we left things the way they were. Two, that we split districts three and four into two districts, so that creates nine. A third option is to redistribute all of the seven districts into nine districts. Four was redistribute the seven into a more equitable spread of the seven. And we <clears throat> were able actually to get that done using the existing road network. But we must point out that the Safia did it via the road network, but the Safia also allows us to populate the, the districts, the new drawn districts as well. So we can do it via the people, numbers of persons living there. And then of course, the option that has been put out there, one giant electoral district for Anguilla, which I guess will eliminate the need for a boundaries commission. But you made a point about you um, in District 1 and wanting to perhaps return to District 2. As a matter of fact, during the campaign, as we moved around, especially up in um, these districts, that was one of the overwhelming um, comments we kept getting back coming to us, that persons wanted to go back into District 2 who were in District 1. There are quite a number of persons that would have said that to us. So there is some interest in addressing some of these perceived inequalities. And then I just wanted to touch a bit about the process. And Mr. Mitchell would know that we would have spoken to him several times since elections. And we would have summoned a meeting of the Electoral com um, com Committee. We would have actually set up a new committee, which kept a few of the old persons and we put in some new persons. And one of the things the committee said at its meeting was that government needed to make its position clear on a lot of the issues that were raised in the previous discussions. And we have done quite a lot of that. We have done quite a lot of that. We have had several meetings. We had one or two retreats where we as a government sat down and went through the various um, points. And we too considered some of what we thought as a government we would like to see. So this process here that we are doing now is yet another step in that, in that sort of overall scheme that we are trying to reawaken the interest of the public in the process. I know the COVID-19 pandemic has dominated our lives, dominated everything. And so we found that there wasn't much interest really in moving the constitutional process forward. So we felt by doing this, going in each district, symbolically, so to speak, that we will get a reawakening of persons' interest in the process. And we are not discouraged by the small numbers we are having because we are also seeing when we check back, because this is also recorded online, excellent video, audio, and everything, the quality is really good, that persons are going back by the hundreds and watching it over. As I mentioned in my, my address, when we checked last, the previous two had well over a thousand persons, thousand views which says to me that persons are going back in their leisure time and they are reviewing and sending their comments. And I also want to continue to encourage persons to send forth their comments. We cannot go out there on social media and just basically say a lot of things about the constitutional reform process when there's an actual physical process going on that allows you to interact with it. And we want to encourage persons to use the various forum that, forum that we have now organized through these meetings, through the emails, to, to communicate with us. Let us know what your thoughts are. And of course, in the question of independence, I am a believer in independence. I think that's ultimately where we should go as a nation. But I think it's going to take some time for us to get there, and I think we have to build institutions of governance that is going to ensure 
that when we take that final step in our constitutional advancement, that we are not simply transferring our dependence from one state to another, that we are capable and able of ensuring that we have the, 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 the institutions in place that will guarantee that the corruption, that the, the abuse of office, the abuse of power is a thing of the past that is really all about building and developing the people of Angola. And I think we are moving towards that direction and I look forward when we get through this exercise to continue that, um, that, that advance to moving towards um, self-determination. I see we have um, two other... Yes, hmm? yes sir. Go ahead. The question of independence, I think, too, it's, it's also important. Um, so if you, if, you, if you're on a journey, you must know what the destination is. And um, you usually have some, time, some kind of time frame. So if you say, well, you're going to the UK, you know it's going to take such a um, certain time and the, 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 the pilots, you know, they do their flight plan and they, they organize everything, right? So I say that to say that um, for me, so I'm an economist and I would have started out in, in development. I was PS economic developer. And one of the things I've always fought, pushed for, and we've never managed to, to get it, and I think is a long-term plan. I mean, one time we did get um, get uh, funding for it. In 2017, it was started. It was meant to be a process, again, going district by district, and you know, and and then Hurricane Irma, Irma put paid to that, and, and funding was withdrawn. So I think that if you're going to talk about independence, we we must it must be done in a concrete way. You mentioned. Um, you know, governance, institutions, and so on. But from the economic side and the financial side, I think we have to set milestones. We have to set, um, you know, work from a plan. Of course, nothing is written in stone, but something concrete. Otherwise, we're just going to be a show. I would be, um, <laughs> you know, 20 years from now, you know, and I would come back, you know, probably probably hear the same thing, you know, but yet the ongoing tensions will still be there and everything that is happening and not happening, blame it on the British. You know, part of, about, part of, uh, part of independence too is about taking responsibility and, and um, you know, for, for things that you do or you don't do. It's about confidence and all those things. So, like everything else, I think there, there would need to be um, a discussion about it and some some mechanism for active discussion so that it's not just a, a true away thing you know um, every two years or when, it, when there's when there's um, anger at the British or whatever then it comes up you know so it must be approached in a systematic fashion thanks thank you very much Dr. Harrigan <clears throat> So I would like persons, um, when they look at the, the draft, in particular to look at part one, which it speaks about the protection of fundamental rights and freedoms. It's quite a long section there. And someone actually does send me a question. Is it already decided that the wording of the Constitution in regards to marriage will not say between the opposite sex. And that's a question that has come up as a sticky point so far in the discussions between the UK and the Anguilla government. And I know we, as an administration, have had long discussions about it. It is what we call one of the thorny issues of the continuing reform. We in Anguilla, we put forward marriage as between a man and a woman. It is put forward in keeping with international norms that marriage can be between members of the same sex. 
that is being put forward, and that is something I think that we have to grapple with in this exercise, and we would like to hear persons' views on it, because at the end of the day, the talks and the discussions we will have will have to represent the views of the people of Angola as much as possible. So thank the, the listener for sending in that question. I don't know if um, Mr. Mitchell or Mary, you have any thoughts on that aspect, the right to marry, should it be between just a man and a woman? Since this we are reading from this one, what's in the section 16, and then the footnotes, because it is, it's interesting. Oh, you want me to read it? Okay, 16.1. Notwithstanding anything in section 17, Every man and woman of marriageable age, as determined by or under any law, has the right to marry a person of the opposite sex and to found a member. And there's a little a, and in the footnote it says, that is Anguilla's proposal. Okay, and now there's another one. Every man and woman of marriageable age, as determined by or under any law, has a right to marry and found a family in accordance with laws enacted by the legislature. And there's a little B there, and that is a UK proposal. Mm -hmm. And then there's a third one. Notwithstanding anything in section 17, every man and woman of marriageable age, as determined by or any law, under or any law, sorry, has a right to marry and to found a family in accordance with laws enacted by the legislature. And there's a little C there. And this says, compromise UK proposal following discussions. So, but the thing is that they want you to pass it, take it out of the constitution and pass the law to so that effect, using language that the whole of the world can pass through. Mr. Mitchell, yeah. any comment? Well, I think everybody knows my personal views already because I've written articles about it. Remember the last Attorney General created quite a controversy in Angola when he brought his husband to Angola. Uh, and I objected to the discriminatory and prejudicial matters that were being said on the radio and wrote an article about it. So everybody knows my views. I am in favor of not discriminating against gay people. If two Anguillian ladies are gay and they want to get married to each other, then I believe they should have a right to do that. I don't believe that we should discriminate. We cannot tell. I don't believe the church or the state, strong as they are and valid as they are, I don't believe they have any right interfering in what people do in the bedroom. Once they are adults and they're not hurting anybody, then they should have the right to show their love in whatever way they consider right. That's my personal view. However, uh, I'm, the more interesting thing is what about the law? What about the law? The law, of course, is the international human rights treaties that are binding on Anguilla. You know, there's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. If Angola passed a law which contravenes the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and an Angolian is damaged as a result of that, the Angolian can take the Angola government and the Angola constitution and everything about Angola to the American Court of Human Rights. And now, we, if we are offended, I mean damaged financially and otherwise by any law passed in Angola, we can take Angola to the European um, human Rights Court and get damages against the government of Angola, which means the people of Angola. So what the British have been saying to us is, look, the British government is ultimately responsible in international forums for Angola. The British government doesn't want to do anything that is going to make them make a mockery of them, that's going to make everybody in the world laugh at them because they are allowing Angola to do something which offends against all principles of fairness and non-discrimination. So they're asking Anguilla to, to say that marriage is a right that can be enjoyed by any people, any persons, two persons, without reference to gender or sex. Non-discrimination. 
However, they have offered a third solution. As Mary Horsford just pointed out, they have dealt with A, B, and C. A, B, and C. C is the compromise. What they have said they believe they can escape public ridicule from the Europeans and the Canadians and the Australians and other people who will laugh at them. They believe they can escape public ridicule and they believe they, can, they might even be able to escape having to pay damages if, as a compromise, we put a wording in, which I think people who are of the religious right, even the most fundamentalist Muslim or Christian, whatever sect they belong to, I think shouldn't object to paragraph C, the, the, the third option. It, as Mary says, it's a compromise. It provides basically, if I remember correctly, that every person in Angola shall have the right to marry based upon a law which is passed by the House of Assembly. So I think Mary's right when she says, so that allows us to pass a law that might discriminate and only allow members of the opposite sex to marry. I don't think it's going to hold water. You see, in the Cayman Islands a few years ago, two men who were married to each other came to work in the Cayman Islands under a similar constitution to what we have. And the court in the Cayman Islands said, never mind there's a marriage act in the Cayman Islands that says only a man and a woman can marry each other. That's a breach of international law. The Cayman Islands marriage law is illegal. It contravenes fundamental human rights. And the court ordered the government to recognize the marriage of the two. I think one was an Argentinian and one was a, an American, two lawyers who were married, came to the Cayman Islands. One was employed by government and one was employed by a private sector law firm. And he began campaigning. The gays in the Cayman Islands and the lesbians in the Cayman Islands had a parade asking for equal rights. And the spouse of the lawyer who was working for government joined the demonstration. And the government said, we're taking away your work permit and your right to reside in Cayman Islands. You must go back to where you come from. And they brought a case against the government of the Cayman Islands, saying that was illegal. The Cayman Islands had to recognize that they were married and therefore had the right to live together as a family. And the Cayman Islands court said, yes, they are right. So even under our present constitution, two gay people can get married. And if they are refused a license by the registrar, they can take the Angola government to court and have the judge declare that the Marriage Act, which says that only a man and a woman can marry each other, is illegal and will order the registrar to give them a marriage license. That can be done right now under our present constitution. So the Christian Council, in um, the discussions leading up to the November 2019 meeting, proposed that to stop that from happening, we need to put in the Constitution a section which says that the Constitution says that only a man and a woman can get married to each other. Once that is there, then no court could interpret anything because it's clear in the Constitution. The British government's response to that in this draft is, we think that's illegal. If we did that, we are going to be, we are going to be fundamentally held to be in the wrong in all international circles because we are allowing an overseas territory to do something which is against the fundamental rights provisions of the international treaties which bind Angola. And we are going to be forced to pay damages to anybody who sues us in an international court. So they have suggested a compromise. Don't put it in the Constitution. Um, let the Constitution be kind of bland and put it in the Act. I don't think it's going to work because the court will have to hold that that act contravenes the international human rights conventions which are binding on us. I think we should just bite the bullet and say to people, listen, you're grown up, you're adults. I personally don't agree with what you all are doing. Nobody can force me to become a homosexual or a gay lady. But if you want to get married to each other, just do it and just, just keep your business private. We are not going to get involved in that. That's, that's your business. I, that's what I believe we should do. We should bite the bullet and give people their rights, regardless of what their sexual orientation is, as they call it. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Mitchell. And uh, I just wanted to say to the, the person that sent in that question before, you can share your views by emailing us. If you're not on social media, you can send us an email at kenneth.hodge at gov.ai. 
aiden.harrigan at gov.ai or clarion.webster the Webster, right? Yes. Clarion.webster at gov.ai. So you can still share by sending in your comments, your views on, on this matter. So this is just one of the, the various sections throughout the new draft, and we're encouraging persons to get a hold of the draft and read it. Read it so you understand what the various things are saying, and do not be afraid to share your opinion. If you cannot make it to these forums for that we are organizing, you can still share in by sending in your comments. So we're about to wrap up, and before I ask the PS, Dr. Aragon, to share his closing comments, I just want to thank our capable technical team across there, Gaff, Gilbert Fleming of Titanium Sounds and in Anguilla, and his um, colleague, and I forget her name again tonight, I hope she doesn't kill me, but really, really very efficient um, technical service supplied here tonight. We want to thank as well Government of Angola website, gov.ai, Radio Angola, and Lloyd's Live for carrying this um, discussion here this evening. And of course, we'll be live with you in District um, 5 next week in North Hill. So we'll give you the venue sometime on Monday or Tuesday. We'll let you know the venue. But our plan is to be in District 5 um, next week. So we want to thank our esteemed Justice Dan Mitchell for coming out and Ms. Hosford and all the others for being here with us this evening. So Doc will give you the final words as we wrap up. Well, I just say that <clears throat> there's actually a version of the draft constitution that provides all the changes, track changes from what was presented um, by the Angola side in November and um, and now what is here. So every every letter, every word that was changed. So Mary, you may find that more useful. Um, as Mr. Hodges said, the, cur the draft that is posted online does, if you read it, it does have um, by way of uh, footnotes, areas where there is a divergence of, of language or which is still open. But we can certainly put the, the track changes version up as well. Mm -hmm. and, and just to say, um, again, thanks to, to those of you who came out, Mr. Mitchell, and Harry, and Clive, yeah, and, and for the excellent job that... Um, you know, that Gaff and, and his team have been doing certainly later on sometime, maybe over the weekend, I will go and and, and um, look at it and via Facebook because you can see the comments that the people have made and try to get a sense of what resonated or, you know, stirred some kind of um, response from the general public. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Harrigan, for an excellent job. Um, this is the third week you are here, and each time we come with something new and different because we don't really want to be the same every single week. We want to keep bringing new information to you as the weeks progress. So, Dr. Harrigan, thanks for an excellent job as always. I'm very glad of the support as well as the technical staff at the ministry for their assistance. So I want to thank you for having tuned in. We ask you, invite you to join us next Thursday evening at 6 o'clock. We're going to be live in North Hill. We will get a location agree, um, sorted out sometime soon, and we'll let you know where that will be. Thank you very much, and a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>